Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of A Millennial Mind. This week, I'm so excited to introduce you all to Dr. Kishan Badalia, also known as DJ Badalia, who became known during the pandemic for his NHS sessions, where he streamed a live DJ set from his kitchen after his shifts on a COVID ward. He is one of the nicest and most humble guys I've ever met, and I'm so excited for you all to listen to this episode. So let's get started. So Badalia, or Kishin, I want to apologise for calling you Badalia and not Kishin. Like in all the emails, I was like, hey Badalia, how are you Badalia? And then I literally listened to a podcast and it was like, Dr. Kishin Badalia. And I was like, oh my God, that must be so annoying. But thank you so much for coming here and for coming on a Saturday. Um, It's a huge commitment and I really appreciate you coming here and I'm so excited to talk about your journey. So tell me, you're a doctor. Yeah, I am. And you're also a DJ. What made you start DJing? Like, why did you begin? Well, I've been into music all my life, ever since I was a child. Growing up, I listened to jazz CDs. My dad always played that when I wanted to go to sleep, just to make me feel more relaxed. And then that inspired me to play the saxophone myself. Oh, wow. But I was too small to play the saxophone when I wanted to actually play it. So I had to play the fife, which is like the small little okay. flute thing, which is really <laughs> annoying. Um, and then the clarinet, so I got to a high grade in that, and I played another saxophone, which is like a soprano saxophone, like a golden clarinet, mm-hmm. and then finally, when I was about 16, 17 and big enough, I played the tenor saxophone, which is like the really nice, deep sounding sax that you hear in a lot of music. Um, so that's what got me into music, and then dance music is when I went to university, right. went clubbing, but to be honest, I wasn't like a massive clubber or like a raver, I never have been, but I just right. loved the fact that there was someone on stage applying what they'd learnt in the music and performing and entertaining people mm. and I translated what I'd learnt at school and in music, my lessons and theory into like a new new passion, new project. So that was the starting point for me and I just developed and developed, won global contests, Radio 1, signed record deals, been on tours, it's just it's just snowballed over, not, over a few years, yeah it's been mad. So how did you apply for your first global contest? Was that like was that the first stepping stone, do you think, that made you think, I definitely want to take this seriously? Or what was that kind of first move? I think the first move was when I was in my second year of medical school and I needed something outside of medicine to focus on and I couldn't figure out what it was. Mm. But I've always loved music and I thought to myself, if something appears now, I'm just going to go straight into it. And it happened at that point in time, there were two final year business students who set up this student record label right. to build experience so they could get jobs in the music industry. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the girls who founded it has a job at uh, Ministry of Sound, all that she worked at Warner, so it worked. And when I was part of that team, they made me head of marketing. I got got us on like BBC Radio, um, collaborated with Spotify and O2 on events, got an award from the Prime Minister, which is crazy, all in the space of six months. And alongside that, I was building networks and skills and understanding how to market myself as an artist. So I thought, let's put myself out there as a DJ. Looking back, I'm like, that's a bit cringy with some of the stuff I did, but it, it was a learning process, and that's what gave me the, the tools to then promote myself and have the confidence to enter contests. I entered a regional contest during my third year medical school exams, which I should not have done. <laughs> I passed them, but it was a distra- I get so easily distracted. Um, entered that, uh, the day after my exams, went to the final in Birmingham, came third, Entered a global one the next day, run by Tomorrowland, which was uh, the biggest festival on the planet. I, I thought, I'm just going really to I'm, go. <laughs> I'm do this to see what happens. And yeah, a couple of weeks later, I got told that I'm, I'm going to be flown out to Barcelona for the final. Um, oh because my, my mix ended up in at number four out of thousands. And they're flying out the top, or their favourite 20 out of the top 50. And um, oh yeah, I went, got flown out, networking with Tomorrowland, met massive artists, brands and the actual finals on a, on a yacht, oh my secret God. location, and I won. Oh my God! So that opened so many amazing. doors for me as a third year medical student, and from there it's just been about how I can use every opportunity to get to the mm. next point, build contacts, like leverage everything, and just grow from there. It's been, it's been crazy, so but I love inspiring. it so much. That's so inspiring, I can't believe it. I find it so interesting that you were studying for medicine and doing all of this at the same time. I mean, are you Indi- you're Indian, right? Yeah. So when your Indian parents like, you should be focusing on your studies. Like anything I do outside of my work, my parents are like, you should be focusing on your work or your studies and everything else <laughs> is a distraction. Um, but you know, it is really hard to manage two things. You know, to be a doctor isn't easy. You know, everyone says it's really difficult because you're working really long hours, yeah. you're caring for people, you have to be on your top form. 
yeah. and then you're not only just doing a little thing on the side you're like actually an incredible dj and entering these competitions and headlining at all these events how did you manage it all well firstly my parents are my biggest fans my biggest supporters so uh, which is which is crazy because the truth, when i had exams they'd say look concentrate on those mm -hmm. then you can enjoy your summer so they give, true. Yeah. they give me the right guidance but they never said like don't do music don't be a dj only be a doctor really? they always said you know you've got this you you're, you're doing this degree now get to the end of it mm -hmm. figure out what you want to do but enjoy your other passions alongside it mm -hmm. they've always like um driven push me to do everything i want to do which is the best thing i could ask for really and is. so yeah um yeah i just just had amazing support from people around me just to just to keep building and, and going yeah. with it. And so do you think you can only have one successful career? So what I mean by that is, you know, there's a saying, Jack of all trades, master of none. And I'm and there is a there is an extended version of that which I'm gonna say afterwards. But there is that saying that people say you should be focusing on one element to be the best in that. Yeah. And it's very hard to spread yourself thin. So being an NHS doctor is incredibly demanding just because of the nature of the job. Do you think you could? Do you think that people out there who are struggling to, you know, work on their side hustle or want to do something else that's completely different from their nine to five should go for it? One billion percent. I'm still learning. I'm still mm -hmm. like learning from the process. Um, and you're right about spreading yourself thin. There's been times where I've done that over the last two years because it's the last two years where my profile has grown so much. I'll be doing like multiple TV interviews in a single day, like in a single day, in a week of working full time, about a month ago, I did 20 interviews oh from 5am to 11pm at night, all national TV and radio. And that's me feeling like this is too much. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm still trying to find out this, this perfect balance, but I believe you can do it. I think at the start, it's always going to be difficult. Some things do have to go. Yeah. Um, but I do honestly believe that as time goes on, if you play a long game with it, you can make both grow sustainably. Right. So for example, over time, you can start outsourcing more of the work. Mm -hmm. So for myself as a DJ, I love making the music and that's what I'm gonna continue doing. But at, alongside that, I also have to uh, build contacts, go to events, network, create my own artwork, arrange photo shoots, editing videos, um, reach out to people to be on podcasts or interviews, that kind of thing, or do a mix on Radio 1. That's still a lot of the work that I'm doing myself. Right. But as time goes on, I can just focus on the music that I love as my passion and hopefully be in a, a comfortable position where people can like, reach out for me. Like I've got a team around I've got a team around me now who are doing things like that. Um, so I think it's about playing the long game and taking time with both things. And you can definitely do two things at once. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. I think it's also about managing your time and being yeah. really strict and setting boundaries. So one of the things you just said is some things have to go. What are some of the things that you've had to let go of? I'd say the things I regret letting go of more, most frequently is that my health and fitness. Right. Because that's really important to me. Mm -hmm. I actually did a degree in sports science, so I know the importance of like health and fitness and, and nutrition, but... Wait, hold on one second. You did a degree in sports science and you done medicine? I did an intercalation, so it was like a wow. full degree in one year. So oh my like, gosh. So after I won that global contest to play at Tomorrowland, that year then I went to Loughborough for a year to do sports science. So full degree in that. And went back to medicine Gosh. and finished that off. But yeah, I love I love health and fitness and that's always had to that's mm. always been the thing that goes. So I told myself about a year ago, eighteen months ago, that health and fitness were non negotiable. Right. So if those things are in place, everything else can work around it because that's mm. what's going to give me longevity. Absolutely. So that's probably one thing that's gone. The things I sacrifice now, um, I think I think I sacrifice it on my own time. Mm. I'm good at seeing friends, good at seeing family. I'm good at working from home or working with a friend, like both doing our own side hustles together in like yeah. say cafe or something. Um, but it's usually my own free time, yeah. which I probably sacrifice. So I try and watch Netflix. I try to. Yeah. Peaky blinders at the moment. So. Okay, nice. Yeah, that's what I do. I think me time is so important. Yeah. I think we underestimate it so much. So in terms of your journey in becoming a DJ, one of the things people must ask you is, how do you actually balance both things? So I've heard you say in other podcasts before that you wouldn't want to do either of them full time. So you love having both. Yeah. But why do you love having both? I love, I love having both because I find them so fulfilling in different ways. Mm -hmm. from, the, from the doctor side, I dedicate my life to becoming a doctor. At school, I do charity work, voluntary work, and that I just love. Mm -hmm. um, 
the degree itself was tough. Wasn't a huge fan of it. Right. Found it a bit long. But again, I love the challenge. It really pushed me to my limits to understand how to be efficient with my time. Mm -hmm. um, and gave, gave, gave me like, wider skills for like, the future. Actually being a doctor now working in a and &E, I absolutely, I don't know, I can't really put it into words. There's no better feeling for me than actually like, helping someone or mm -hmm. being someone who's like, pivotal in saving their life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's like repeated several times each day when I'm working in a and &E. It's just the best feeling. People around me, it's high energy, it's full of adrenaline. That's why I love being a doctor. Being a DJ, it's more about having a business and something that I'm fully in control, control of. Mm. Doctor, I'm not fully in control of that. There's so many variables around me. Right. But in business and in, in my music career, the time I've put in to that as a whole is proportional to what I get out, right. 100%. It's full of ups and downs. There's a lot of downs. The highs are high, the lows are very low. Mm -hmm. But it's worth it for those highs. And those highs are releasing music, getting amazing feedback on it or performing like, on stage to thousands of people. Mm -hmm. I had my, main, my first main stage this summer at Camp Festival, and it was to 30,000 people in front of me oh before Becky Hill, and she was a headliner. And it's moments like that that made me realize that this is why I do do it, and that this is why those lows, you have to endure and get through them. Right. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a balance of like, passion across both, but um, yeah, having my own journey that, just, just my journey and building something that's meant for me to be for my whole life. Absolutely. And, you know, you talk about a lot of the lows. Yeah. I think anyone who's an entrepreneur has faced a significant amount of rejection. And anyone who's putting themselves out there and trying to do something of their own, even with me with a podcast, I've messaged hundreds and thousands of people and they just haven't replied. Yeah. Uh, so people always say to me, how do you get your guests? Well, it's, it's genuinely just part of luck through Instagram. It's just me messaging them like, hey, do you want to come on my podcast? Uh, it's a bit more to it than that, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, tell me how you faced rejection and what was one of your, the biggest moments where you thought that was just such a hit? I could name so many every single day now, but I love it. It's weird. But what you mentioned about me messaging people, that's exactly what I did at the very start of this last two year period where things have just grown exponentially. I have hope. <laughs> 100%. I, one of my friends said to me, don't type a message to influencers or like famous people to get them to reply to you and get, get, get them on there. Send them a video message or okay. voice note them. And I thought this is a bit strange. This feels really foreign to me. Right. And I remember doing, I did these DJ sets in my scrubs at the start of lockdown. I saw. Yeah, so and, cool. and, that, and that's what, really took off, but it took off because I got it in front of as many people as I could. Right. Like I voice noted as many celebrities as I possibly could, as many influencers. I made lists of them, I emailed their managers, um, I video messaged them, video messaged like every single meme page. Out of like really? Every, like about 50 meme pages I video messaged. Probably two got back to me, but it, it was two that added so much. Really? One of them was the um, world record egg that was out there oh, to yeah. beat like Kim Kardashian. They replied, they're like, record us a video, we'll post it on our story. No way. And what did, you, what did you message them in a video message? I just said to them, like... Um, Asking for a friend. Yeah, I was just, I was just like, briefly telling them who I am, what I'm doing, um, like, why what I'm doing would be great for their audience. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I, just, I just kept it so simple. I remember it was just simple. Um, I think adding value is key. Yeah, Them absolutely. understanding how you connect with, with their audience. Mm. So with that particular one, their, um, their brand is about this egg and it represents mental health and the egg can break and that's yes. like a, your mental health breaking down. So there was this connection between that and me being a doctor and COVID and lockdown and people's mental health. So that was like a way of my bringing my music into their brand to help people's mental health. Wow, so that's amazing. So create that connection, just a numbers game. There are other brands that I was probably more suited to, mm -hmm. but they didn't see it. But if you message enough people, someone will reply. I agree. Um, but equally, people will say no, and that's rejection, but that's, that is what it is. About the worst feelings of rejection I've had, I would say where I've learnt the most is when I was probably a year or two after the Tomorrowland experience, I released a couple of songs. I'd already had one released globally on Sony, Ministry of Sound. Mm -hmm. um, I had another one, and then I came across this amazing US singer who has millions of listeners on Spotify. Mm -hmm. I think she'd been on like, the Ellen show, huge audiences. And I loved her voice. 
and I came across her and I thought I would love to remix her her song, put a dance spin on it. Right. And in my mind, I was like, this is a great idea because there's no remixes of her song out there already. Or maybe there was one. Okay. Um, they usually use promotional tools for getting like a non-commercial act or non dancey act into clubs so that, you know, reaches new audiences. Mm -hmm. um, so I did, I thought, okay, I'm going to reach out to her team, ask if I can do a remix. And, they, and straight away, her like manager or who was looking after the music replied straight away saying, like, yeah, we'll have for you to try it on specs, on speculation, that like, if they like it, they'll release it. Okay. Because they'd heard my previous music, and I thought, okay, I've got a body of music. Mm. If I do something similar, there's a high chance it will get released. Um, so I worked on that. This guy was the president of basically signing artists at Columbia in America, big, big name. Um, and he was entertaining me. I made this remix. I probably spent about a month of all my evenings on this. Oh, gosh. Um, I, I put all my like love into it, and I was like so excited, naturally be invested because it'd be mm. a huge career springboard for me. Um, but I made it. Um, I finished it off. It sounded incredible. Like, I know it sounds amazing. No one's heard it. Right. And I send it to me. <laughs> I said, yeah, I sent it to you. I sent it to them. Did reply? Did reply? Chased them. I had a manager, another manager at the time, and they nudged him, and then they just replied saying, it's not. It's um. It's just something vague, like it doesn't kind of fit the direction they're going in. But, okay. but it basically question like, why did you say yes when you know what direction mm. I'm going in already? Mm. So I thought, okay, I'm going to try one more. I'm not going to ask them for permission to do it. I'm just going to do it. Complete different type. Again, they said it's not the right time for us, and that's making you think, right? I've done everything I can. Everything I can. It sounds brilliant. I've ticked all the boxes you did. We kind of agreed on at the beginning. And now you're saying no for various odd reasons. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say that's happened more times now since, but sometimes they say yes, and sometimes yeah. it does fit with their plan. And actually, they were giving me an opportunity. Um, it might have fit, if they really loved it, if it fit with their vision, mm -hmm. they might have released it, but something didn't align for me at that point in time. And that, that really hurt, it made me real, feel really sad and like, heartbroken. Mm -hmm. um, and whenever that happens, it it makes you feel like really down, but I think that's just part of the process. What, what I've learned from that is you have to, it gives you an opportunity to learn what the market wants and refocus your efforts in improving your craft in certain areas. It might not be that your music's bad, you might just have to understand what the American market wants exactly. and what they want. And sometimes you might do that, but it's just not for them. And it's so important to not take things personally. Yeah. And I try and now look at like the smallest positive thing in something. So in that, I guess you could look at it and say, well, at least they replied to me and they were interested in me, yeah. right? I messaged the uh, CEO of Netflix the other day. Not Netflix, oh, wow. it was this, I think it was the co-founder of Netflix. And um, about three months ago, and he DM'd me back yesterday and he said, I'm a bit busy, but- He replied. He replied. And he said, I'm a bit busy, but uh, you can try if you want. Try and what? I thought, as you can try with my PR person if you want. He goes, probably not, I'm a bit busy, but you can try if you want. He got back to you. And I thought, well, he got back to me, yeah. like, I can try. So instead of looking at that, and I didn't, I just didn't take it personally, I just thought, oh, that's so nice, because there's so many people I've messaged, and then it's just like, red, and I'm just like, oh, okay. And, and that degree of honesty is so nice as well, it's like, look, I would so potentially nice. be interested in, in, in that. Yeah, but I'm busy. So yeah. like, you can try work out, work out a date if you want with like my agent or my PR person. But yeah, I just think looking for the positive in everything and not taking things personally because sometimes it just isn't about you. Like in that situation, it wasn't about you. You're an incredible mm. DJ, but that mix just didn't align with what they were doing. And to yeah. not take it so personally is so easy on reflection, and I know that, but at that time it's really difficult. So how mm. do you in that time think, you know, how do you push yourself to keep trying? Because I think one of the things I've noticed in lockdown, so many people started a new business. Yeah. And as lockdown has come to an end, what I'm noticing is loads of those businesses don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because, like we've said, your journey as an entrepreneur is really up and down. Yeah. And during those downs, it's really hard to get back up again. Yeah. So what are some of your tips on how to keep persevering and pushing through? I think you need to have a, a plan of action always written down mm -hmm. uh, and a list of things you're, you're working through. Um, it's easy to put all your attention into one thing you with the resources you have that might be all you can do yeah but you always need to think what other areas do I need to focus on within that within that industry to get to that same end point um, I think if you can write down your, your map 
you're worried about journaling, that's what I do a lot of, you can say how many from A to B, um, break down the smaller steps mm -hmm. and find your way there. And if you hit a roadblock, you find another way around to get to the same point. Like there's, there's, especially in creative industries, there's a billion ways to get the same end result. Absolutely. Um, you don't have to go through that same channel. So that guy rejected me mm -hmm. and it made me feel sad. But I went to another label, another artist, and they said yes. And then the artist told me he didn't like the remix mm -hmm. for some strange reason. The record label <laughs> loved it. Right. So they released it. So, you know, it's just a combination of things aligning for you. Just keep persevering. It really is a numbers game. Right. So keep, keep just like trying the numbers um, and realizing that, as you say, it's not personal. It's just these mar markets are so saturated that you have to keep, keep going, just keep. You know, mm -hmm. pushing and you you will open doors as you go along. And there's just so many ways to get to a conclusion. You know, I heard this saying once, and it was like, five plus five is ten, so it's yeah. eight plus two, so it's fifteen minus five. Exactly. And there's just endless possibilities, and every single one of those is a fact. So, yeah. and every single one comes to the same answer. And I'm just so excited you talk about goal setting and breaking things down because I've given you a performance planner, which is a product I've created. Oh, nice. Which is essentially, you know, you write your goal down, you yeah. break it down, you break it down by week. And then every week you have days where you you know prioritize your time block, uh, mm. you have your time, your 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 manifestation, your gratitude. So you're encompassing all of that in it. Because I really believe, and I did a podcast with Roxy uh, this week as well. Is you know your thoughts become your reality. So yeah. every day you write your tasks down, and then you write down some affirmations. Yes. Yeah. And you're telling yourself these things about yourself. They will come true. You they know? will. And I want to yeah. talk to you a bit more about that because I read in one of your posts that you said it's really important to have a vision. So yeah. apart from using the performance planner, which you will, will be your new method. <laughs> yeah, definitely. What's your current yeah. method on how to, you know, what, how do you how do you manifest or how do you write your goals or how do you how do you achieve them? Oh, that's such a big question. Um, I'm very ambitious. I know where I want to see myself, um, but where I want to see myself does does change based on what's happening around me. Mm -hmm. uh, my my biggest dream would be say to play on the Tomorrowland main stage. That would be. An absolute like, dream of mine. I'm gonna the, clip this clip when you actually achieve it. That'd be a, we'll that, do like a before yeah. and after, like you saying in this podcast that was your dream, and then you playing on the stage. I feel like it's gonna happen. I mean, I've got dreams, and even if it's not the main stage yet, that might happen in ten years. Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. Not in my control. Um, I might play at another big, bigger stage than what I did five years ago. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that would be again. I'd love that. And. Just to kind of illustrate how I break things down, I knew that to, to get to that point, I would need to create some stronger ties between me and Tomorrowland. Mm. So this year I signed a record deal with one of the record labels owned by the guys who are the residents of Tomorrowland, the resident wow. DJs, and they have their own massive stage, it's called the Smash the House stage. And that's usually a feeder stage to a big, much bigger one. I mean, that's a huge one, Dua Lipa's performing on there. That's crazy. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just about um, having an overarching goal, mm -hmm. breaking it down, um, but also you, can, you need feedback loops where you think, okay, I did this, I got this response back, or I didn't get a response. Let me just reevaluate what my approach was. Am I, right. was I being you know, too self-centered about my approach? Should yeah. I be offering to add value before I even ask for anything in return? There's so many things you need to do. Am I approaching the right person or am I not? Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, when you're goal setting, you really need that feedback loop back to yourself. Absolutely. And, and the self-awareness. The reflection. Yeah. That's in the performance plan, by the way. <laughs> yeah, the reflection is key. It's so important to reflect. I think people forget that part, and it's often actually the scariest part. So the prompts I have in there, and I think I'm now used to them, is what did you do well today or enjoy? Yeah. And what didn't you do so well? And what I was noticing actually last month is I was continuously writing the same thing about what I didn't do well, and I was yeah. like, no you need to write something different because yeah. it's very easy to pull yourself on saying you're doing the same thing right and it's very easy on saying that I'm doing the same thing wrong because yeah. actually you're not exploring anywhere else you're going wrong because it's yeah. scary. It's scary to think like, was I a bit too selfish or did I come across in the right way or yeah. perhaps could I have been nicer or whatever it is. It's interesting to actually spend that time and I think that's why solitude is really important. So when we were talking yeah. about me time, I think when you have time to yourself without any noise, no WhatsApp notifications going on every 10 minutes or Instagram feeding you like, you're doing amazing, I love your podcast, this is great, whatever it is, yeah. you actually have that time to think, well, what did I, what can I improve? 
or yeah. what can I change? And it's I just truly believe that when you spend time in solitude and you don't have that outside noise, you truly know the answer in your heart. Like often I'll yeah. be walking and I'll listen to music and this is gonna sound so lame, but whatever, I'm just gonna say it. <laughs> I genuinely like speak to myself and I pretend like I'm on a podcast and I'm telling my journey and I'm telling my story. Yeah. And often when I'm talking about what I would say in 10 years, it helps me to identify how I did it. So sometimes I'll say like, I got to this stage because I did X, Y, and Z. So then I know, well actually that's what I need to do. Yeah. And it's interesting to say, okay, in 10 years time, what do I want to achieve? And then how would I just say, let's just say a roundabout way of what's my roadmap of learning to get there. People often have a roadmap on, okay, I want to achieve this, but what's the learning roadmap you need to go through? And yeah. that's really key in understanding those small steps because that's where the fun is actually in the yeah. learning of it. Like Definitely. the other day on, um, when I was editing my podcast, I learned how to zoom in and I know that sounds so ridiculous. I've been trying to zoom in on the podcast for like two years <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, I did it. And it's only because I pressed enter, like cropped the frame and I pressed enter and I was like, oh my God, I finally <laughs> learned how to do it. <laughs> and I was so happy about myself. I was just like, this is the best thing ever. But it's those small moments that make you feel really happy. It's actually not about the big moments. No. It's an accumulation. Small wins. Lots. Small wins. It's like that, that, that end goal, that Twilight main stage is a nice end goal. If it doesn't happen, I'm okay with that. Right. But it's the journey of, you know, getting to that point. It might be that in 10 years, I don't want that. I want something else. Exactly. But it's, you know, it's that journey and that hustle and these small small wins that you get. Um, and things change all the time. Well. Starting the podcast, I didn't I didn't know I would be here. I, I didn't know I would launch, you know, coaching on site. I then didn't know I would launch the performance planner. Yeah. I didn't know that any of this stuff would happen. It just happened so organically because, as you say, things change. You don't have to have it all mapped out, but you have right. to have some sort of plan. Some things may come in between that, and that's great. And some yeah. things may drop, and that's also okay. But one of the things I really wanted to talk to you about, and I think a lot of people struggle with this when they launch something, and it's so visible on social media, is how do you deal with negativity? And do you face any negativity? I've been quite lucky, um, because when I started doing my um, DJ sets and my scrubs, mm -hmm. it was all about lifting spirits and morale, and it was all good vibes. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not someone who's out there doing anything controversial. Mm -hmm. um, Quite quickly, I got an agent who works in TV, and I said, I'm not going to talk about anything political, yeah. nothing COVID-specific. I'm going to go on TV to talk about my music mm -hmm. and why I'm doing what I'm doing. Right. And if, as a result of that, they want to ask about my experiences, I'll share that, which would be nothing political. Right. Um, so, luckily, I got a lot of like, really positive feedback, and naturally you get some random trolls but i'm very yeah. like who are these people just just be quiet like i don't, yeah, I just don't care <laughs> i don't engage with them at all um but i've been quite lucky because i don't see that many and i've compared mm -hmm. mine to like other friends who are doctors right. and they get they can get ridiculous numbers of trolls threatening mm -hmm. messages and it's really really harmful and horrible um as time has gone on i've done a lot more tv where i've since i've been more comfortable talking about my own stuff mm -hmm. I've now done government campaigns, NHS campaigns for the Department of Health, UN, Sport England, which are much more, like, they have a political messaging behind them, or, like, I'm talking about rules and why things are happening. Right. But obviously everyone associates that with the government and things that they don't necessarily agree with all the time. So whenever I do anything, I have to understand what is the evidence for that messaging that I'm delivering, so I'm confident in what I'm, what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And then if there's people on Twitter who are trolling me or reporting me to the GMC or I've been reported so many times to my employers. Really? My, like, for example, by anti-vaxxers. Um, right. They tweet me, my hospital's told me, um, and <laughs> I just think, when, when you first see that, I'm like, okay, this feels threatening. Yes, but actually, the, these people are just keyboard warriors, most of them. Yeah. Um, and, I'm, and I'm really good at just ignoring them or, I've been, I've been memed before as well. There, that, I was telling really? to a meme, yeah, this, about a year ago, okay. I was on like Archbishop of Banterbury, British memes. Oh my god, I follow all those pages. Yeah. What, what was it? Oh, I don't want to go into it. <laughs> it's a bit embarrassing for me. Um, I won't put it up. Let's just cut that. <laughs> I got, I got, I got memes, and it was actually it wasn't embarrassing for me. It was just a weird experience because all of a sudden I was on these big pages, all these celebrities are commenting, and mm -hmm. some people were like, "Who does this guy th think he is?" And wow. um, I wasn't doing anything wrong, basically, I was in my, I did a TV interview, mm -hmm. and someone took a photo of the TV screen, mm -hmm. and I was in a kitchen wearing my scrubs, which I normally do with my 
for yeah. my interviews anyway or for my DJ sets. Mm -hmm. um, and for that particular broadcaster, they said, can you wait, wait a stethoscope? So all my stethoscope. Thinking, okay, this can look like it's NHS yeah. kitchen. It could be in any kitchen, in any hospital, anywhere in the world. Of course. But someone was captioned it on Twitter saying, like, <laughs> why is this guy wearing a stethoscope in his kitchen? <laughs> I thought, oh no, this is going to blow up. What's wrong with that? Well, I don't know. But, but what's so crazy? But then someone replied to that saying, if I was a doc, if I studied six years to become a doctor, I'd have my stethoscope in the gym, in the shower, yeah. in bed. Good for you. And that, got, and that positive spin of it went big wow. time viral. Mm -hmm. um, but alongside that, there were quite weird messages I didn't like. And actually, my parents, I told them about it. They're like, are you feeling all right about this? They're a bit cons that, was the, that was the only time they were concerned about Aww. all my online stuff. That's really and, sweet. I just blocked it out and I just thought, you know what, we can put a positive spin on this. Let's just like ride this wave. Let's, let's share it to more meme pages. Yeah, absolutely. It yeah. It's so funny. People always say that if something's said that's humiliated, like if you feel humiliated by something or, you know, someone's taking, uh, how do you say taking the piss? In a more polite taking way. the mick. Taking the mick. There making we go. Making fun of you. If someone's making fun of you. There you go. I'm like, how do you say that? <laughs> if someone's making fun of you, the best thing to do is just make fun of yourself. Yeah. They can't attack you. Like, if you know your flaws and you just take them on in, like, a jovial sense, then no one can make you feel bad. It's, like, within your control, right? 100%. So I love that. I love how you're so positive. And I actually just... screenshotted some of the funny comments. Yeah. Um, like there's, a, there's, like, a screen... Someone put a GIF of a man using a stethoscope on a door or something. <laughs> Ridiculously stupid things that hit the mic out of me. Um, I, I screenshotted those and made, like, an actual feed post, like, saying, so this is the me, like... I it's, love that. People loved it. Yeah, I love it. It works in my favour. I don't think that's offensive to you. I think that's cool. No. I don't understand what's so offensive. I don't know why everyone... Well, that's great for you. It's good press for you, I guess, that everyone just <laughs> found it so ridiculous that you were worrying about But actually, people on dating apps, like, after that, people did this thing. Are you the guy from that meme? Are you the stethoscope guy? I've had that with... Oh. That's so funny. It was funny. really funny, yeah. That's so funny. Well, good way to open. I guess you should put that as your Tinder profile. Yeah, good do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, one of the things I really wanted to speak to you about was... Uh, there's no such thing as an overnight success. Or is there such thing as an overnight success? I think there is. There is? Not for everyone, not for most people. I went to an event a couple of nights ago and um, one of the organisers of the event said, that girl over there, I think she was 13 or 14, mm -hmm. her life changed because she was on Ellen. Wow. And from that she's had like, mega brand deals, she's like, flying to LA like every week. She's absolutely rolling in it right now. What does she do? I'm not sure what she does. Okay. Something to do with like food, lifestyle, being being a child. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Just I'm... being 14 year old. <laughs> yeah, what you see on Ellen is viral people. Right. How do they get on Ellen though? I don't know. I don't get it. What's the process? <laughs> well, actually, we had a conversation with Ellen. Right. And her team for, for my stuff. Oh, not been gosh. on there yet. Fingers crossed. That would be amazing. In few months. That might may happen. That'd be really cool. But yeah, you just get approached by like their producers or they see something and mm -hmm. get in touch. Um, but that's an example of an overnight success where okay. you might post something funny and go viral and it just pops off worldwide. But do you think that really does happen? Because what I've seen is some people may go viral, but I don't know anyone that's gone viral just from one video. You know, like people say, for example, Justin Bieber was found through YouTube. Yeah. He uploaded so many videos of himself singing. Yeah. So when people say, oh, there is such thing as an overnight success, sometimes I think what we don't see is everything beneath the iceberg. That is true. You just see the tip. Yeah. And there's just so much grind and so much hustle and so much hard work. And Joe Wicks talks about this as well as he had, and this is the only thing that keeps me going and keeps me inspired, <laughs> but he talks about how he used to have classes in Richmond Park. Oh, I've seen those. And he literally yeah. used to have one, two people. And he'd turn up on his own people, sometimes. Turn up by himself. Yeah. And now look at him. And yeah. he just says, like, you know, it's all about that journey. It's all about perseverance and working through it. And you face that as well. So yeah. would you say you've had an overnight success? 100% no. I've dedicated my whole life to this journey. And I don't know what the end point will be. Mm -hmm. But I don't plan on stopping. I think maybe for the absolute tiniest minority, they get lucky. But for, yeah, for most people, it's about consistency and perseverance. And I think if you can be consistent in something you're passionate about and learn, reflect navigate the, the crazy worlds that you're trying to the industries you're in then mm -hmm. you know you you will you will grow Absolutely. it's about growth over a long period don't rely on happening like tomorrow or next week small steps enjoy them and yeah over time you will get there and don't focus too much on the metrics as well i think it's so easy to get lost in them i yeah. often got lost in them and i thought so many times you know well i don't want to continue anymore because i'm not 
I'm not getting anywhere. But that's how it feels. A really good example is when I started posting my DJ sets and my scrubs, mm -hmm. um, I would get, on some videos, I'd get like 100 views. Okay. And I, I had a few thousand followers there, not many, from my yeah. previous DJ stuff. And yeah, I might get, I don't know, 20 likes. And I was like, this is a really good video. No one, no one yeah. actually cares. And I'd be doing it for two weeks. I thought, okay, Wayne Lineker put me on his profile. I got a few followers and okay. he shouted me out. That's cool. Yeah. But now the hype's died down. Mm. Then I spoke to my friend who does other bits and pieces on social media. He's just like very ana like analytical about what's out there. He works in PR. And he said, no, it's not about having hundreds and thousands of views or likes. Think about it as that hundred views you got are a hundred new people who saw your video. Right. So it's about eyes on you. Exactly. So ever since then, it's been about reach, like being seen in as many places as possible, mm -hmm. whilst being you know, consistent to what you do, and that's that's literally what I did. And from doing that, the right people do see you at the right points. And I think when it's meant to be, it will come. And often, I think there's a misconception that you shouldn't do things for free. So a lot of people ask me, you know, um, I think a lot of people think I don't have a job and they think I do this full time, but I don't make any money from the podcast. So great job though. I wish, <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could do this full time. Um, but you know, I think a lot of people have a misconception around you should just, you shouldn't do things for free because a lot of people ask me now, like, but are you making any money from it? And I'm like, no. And they're like, well, why are you doing it? And I'm like, wait, what? Like, why do you think I'm doing it? That's, that's what it's. Yeah. There's so much focus on monetizing everything, and if you're not monetizing something, you're not achieving. And sometimes when you're asked to do things for free, it feels that someone's not appreciating you. So how yeah. do you work around that? Because have you worked for free for people before, and do you think it's necessary? I've worked for free most of my DJ career. Mm -hmm. It's only been in the last year where I've been more consistent in monetizing. As time has gone on, like I can monetize things more more easily mm -hmm. because I've, I've laid a foundation which I laid for free right um when I started I would uh I would reach out I'd be in Birmingham and I'd reach out to club promoters from all around the UK and say look I would love to play in your club I'll play the hour when the club is completely empty to the room to the empty room mm -hmm. um not charge anything I'd pay for my own hotel and travel I'd bring wow. friends and say, look, my friends will share it on social media, just adding value. Yeah. And they'd be like, yep, yeah, fine, come along. Um, if it works well, we can have you back. I knew in my mind, we're doing them a huge favour because their DJ doesn't want to play that first hour anyway. Of course. And they're getting the DJ to come for free and bring friends. But that's fine. It works, yeah. for, it works for my journey. And they meant that I could say my first ever gig was at a previous world number one club. Mm -hmm. That they got me a gig in, in Kavos when I went there with my friends. Again, Amazing. unpaid. But then that created a movie, like a video that I'd be sending to like other people who booked me, and that laid the foundation again. These remixes, probably a good three or four of my releases, I've been completely unpaid, but they've been for right. some of the biggest DJs in the world. So my name is next to theirs on Spotify. Mm -hmm. Their streams are on my track Amazing. because I'm associated, and that's unpaid. But mm -hmm. that then gets me another remix, gets me a record deal. Um, you know, you've got to work for free. But it's about finding that, that perfect balance where you're, exactly. you're... The thing is, when you work for free, you have so many opportunities because you can, you can explore the industry a bit more, see if that's mm -hmm. actually for you. You can build networks and experience. You can build skills. Um, it's just a really good, a good time for you. There's no pressure for you to have to earn money from it. Exactly. So I think, yeah, it's got to be done to, to lay this foundation. And even when you're growing, you'll still have to work for free, even when you're getting paid, there'll be things exactly. you do just for you know, promotion or um, exposure, exposure yeah. or just because you, you enjoy it. And it's important to remember, it is important to monetize. Yeah. The reason why is because you can create better content. So everyone like and save this video because it will help me monetize. <laughs> um, but it really does help because you can then invest in more things and you can make everything better. Yeah. So, you know, because I now I've invested in the studio, for me, the next step would be to have my own studio. You know, there would yeah. be so many, there's so many more things that you can do if you are making money. So it is important to do that. But I think when you're really passionate about something, like you've just said, your journey, you yeah. can only do all those things if you love it. You can only really like message all these clubs, play yeah. for free, because you enjoy playing in a club. Yeah. If your mission and your purpose is to get attention or validation from others, you will never ever be able to do those things because it's not truly what's in your heart and it's not truly what you want. So yeah. it's really important to remember to do things that you truly want to do, rather than doing it for the wrong reasons. Because otherwise you won't want to do all of that hustle and hard work and grit. You won't have it in you. 
hundred percent. It's got to be completely natural and organic. And one of my friends, uh, Rupi, Doctor's Kitchen. He he. When I when I went for dinner with him a few months ago, mm -hmm. I was talking about his direction and what inspired him. And he said, "I just genuinely want people to be as healthy as they possibly can be." Yeah. It was such a genuine way of doing it. He just launched an app, and mm -hmm. yeah, yeah making making money from that is 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 a, a great thing to happen. Like, that's the ideal, but. When I, when I ask about it, it's like, I just want people to know how to eat well and I want to give them the best possible like, recipes and meals. It was so genuine. And you can see that with him because he doesn't yeah. do it for, for, for the fame or for the likes or for anything. You can truly see that. Yeah. And that's why I think it's also really important to explore. So yeah. try whatever it is. And what we mentioned before is you, know, you have that phrase, um, jack of all trades, master of none. But actually it's oftentimes better than a master of one. So oftentimes yeah. better than a master of one just shows you that you don't have to be, you know, a specialist all the time in that one field. So for you, you can be an incredible doctor yeah. and be an incredible DJ and also have a focus on health and fitness or yeah. some other things that you love to do. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to have one direction in life. And I often think that that's sometimes promoted now is that you can't focus on too many things. You know, you yeah. can't have so many different businesses, but actually you can. Because yeah. you don't have to, like you said, the more and more you develop, you can hire other people to do those things for you. Yeah. So what you're truly passionate about, you'll, you'll start by exploring. And then the things that you actually love, you'll grow a team around you to help you. Yeah. And I think that's really important as well. So mm -hmm. before we close today, because I've loved having you on, what's one of your biggest pieces of advice you'd give to someone starting something new? I think um, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So the first thing is, if you have an idea and a concept, just, just start. Mm -hmm. um, because if you don't, you'll, you'll regret it. Um, and when you have started, just put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. Speak to people, network, reach out to people, phone people, just be seen. Mm -hmm. uh, and if, because if you don't, you'll never know if they would ever come on your podcast or you know, sign you to their record label, you just don't know. Be persistent with that. Um, mm -hmm. And hopefully one of those shots will pay off. Absolutely. That's probably my not, biggest. Not having, not being scared is so important. There's so yeah. many times that I've messaged, I'm not even going to say who I've messaged, I've messaged some crazy people <laughs> and I've just thought, I can't message them. It's just like too embarrassing. And I'm like, do you know what? Why not? Because if somebody looks at a message and thinks this girl, this random girl wants to message me to be on her podcast, what are they going to say about me? That I'm yeah. working hard, that I'm trying. Yeah. Like, what's the worst? And they might just be busy. And that's why they're not replied. And you like, don't know. the worst someone's going to think of you is you're trying. No one's going to yeah. think you're an idiot. And if they think that, oh, I'm too good for you, then that's their ego and you don't want them. No, just, yeah. So, like, they're not doing it for the right reasons because they're yeah. going to think, well, I'm too good to come on to your podcast or I'm too good to play your DJ set or I'm too good to share your content. So, yeah. actually, those people you filter out and the genuine nice people, you, they're, if they're too busy, you just got to take it as at least they recognise me, at least they replied. Yeah. And if they do reply, then... At least you tried, you know, like you went for it. And you never know, the Netflix guy might, <laughs> might say no to you now. Yeah. But or, or be busy now. But he, you're in his DMs now. Exactly. You could in about five years, you might have five million followers, and actually, he wants to be on a podcast, and he remembers you. <laughs> could, have, could happen that way around. You never know. But thank you so much for coming. Thank I appreciate it so much, and I'm so grateful you came on here to share your journey. And I'm sure you're going to be playing at Tomorrowland, and I'm going to be there in the audience. Yeah, come on. Um, well, actually, we'll have to invite you back soon. But, then. <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much. For thank you. Hey everyone, and thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Wherever you're listening or watching, if you could press the like, follow, and subscribe button, it would mean the world to me.